to get started here. Excellent. Hello, hello, and welcome to today's edition. It's May 25th, believe it or not, uh, of the Cardia user group. And we're very excited today to have a guest speaker who we'll introduce in just a minute. Um, but we need to get through a little bit of housekeeping. So I do want to cover that the Cardia working group is uh, covered by the Hyperledger antitrust policy. You can find that here in our meeting notes. I will link the meeting notes in our chat for anybody who might not have that saved. Um, there are also community meeting notes, so feel free to chime in and uh, make adjustments as you as you feel fit. Um, additionally, we have a Hyperledger code of conduct, which uh, to paraphrase, we're gonna be nice to each other. We're gonna encourage uh, collaboration and communication among our, our community here. And hopefully everybody feels welcome and encouraged to have a voice in this space. If you have any um, concerns, you can reach out to Ken or myself as co-chairs of this committee, uh, or, or you can reach out to Hyperledger directly through some of these links. They give you a, an opportunity to chime in there. Would anybody like to introduce themselves that's new or potentially it's been a while? Uh, we'd be happy to have you introduce yourself on today's call. Okay, we've got a quiet bunch. Hopefully you're drinking your, uh, you've got a beverage in front of you, you are ready to go. We've got an exciting uh, speaker and presenter today. So we have Surat joining us, Surat Pala. Ken, you have more personal experience. Would you like to do his introduction? Uh, Surat is a, an entrepreneur and has uh, taken at least one company that I'm aware of through a successful acquisition. Um, and the reason that we contacted him is because he has some experience in workplace drug testing in order to enlighten the Cardia community, those who are either attending today or watching the recording, uh, about some of the challenges and um, perhaps opportunities for Cardia to improve um, the user experience and the privacy in uh, workplace drug testing. So we welcome Sir Hot today. Um, we're glad to have you here and hope to be enlightened by your experience so that we don't have to repeat some of the, the lessons learned that you've already taken into account. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Yes, I, I am glad to be here. Um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I have been an accidental um, um, entrance to the, I you would call workplace drug testing market, because like you said, I mean, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I had uh, previously started a few different companies, some successful and unsuccessful ones, uh, but my path to drug testing is started with um, uh, my uh, former company, Confirm Biosciences, which was like a, a commercialization company in the field of point of service testing. Um, uh, and, Initially, we we started you know in early two thousands with the goal of bringing testing to you know individuals and corporations, um, and we did not necessarily you know tackle uh, workplace test drug testing at the beginning, uh, but as we evolve as a company and we decided to focus more on um, you know cash basis. Uh, uh, testing and not so much reimbursement and healthcare and Medicare and so forth. Uh, we found that, you know, workplace, workplace drug testing was a growing market for, you know, for obvious reasons. I mean, some of them are very unfortunate as we know, uh, you know, and, and we're still going through the um, epidemic of um, uh, drug abuse. And, and, and uh, you know, I, I think the last time I checked almost 100,000 people a year dying from uh, drug abuse and overdose. Um, so I'll, I'll, you know, maybe I'll, 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 um, I'll stop there and and would love to like uh, see what could be the best way I can tackle some of the questions that um, that you think I can answer and be a resource for the for the for the panel here. For, for those that are unfamiliar with drug testing, you said point of service testing. Mm -hmm. um, what what are the implications of that? Point of service testing is. Um, is bring is basically uh, bringing the test to where the uh, 
action is, uh, and it can happen in a multiple ways. It can happen in a in an instant way, meaning if you're using an instant uh, test. Uh, and many of the things that I will say will will you know maybe we're talking about it from a drug testing perspective, but it can also apply to other type of uh, wellness tests as, as well. But when we talk about point of service testing, it can be either a test uh, uh, like a lateral flow test, which is a you know like a, like a you know, very standard urine test that you might know, or pregnancy tests where you you know give a sample in in, in some sort of fluid, uh, oral and you know oral and or urine and or, or, or so forth, and then the uh, the test itself will react. Uh, to the fluid and we'll, 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 we'll give a result right there at the time. And that will be a, you know, instant test. But then you could also collect a sample, again, urine, saliva, hair, uh, and take the possession of the sample with a chain of custody and then send the sample to a laboratory where the result will come from a lab result. Uh, so point of service uh, covers those two different use cases. Both the collection of uh, tests that need to be sent to uh, or specimens that need to be sent to a lab, and those that uh, are immediately reactive and give an indication within mm -hmm. five, ten minutes, a half an hour. Are they all very short, or are they some take longer than that? Even though they're immediate tests, they all take less than three minutes, four minutes, the tops. Mm -hmm. um, and when we talk about instant tests in the drug testing world, we're basically talking about just two forms, which is uh, urine and saliva. Uh, urine being, you know, you know, my numbers might be a little bit outdated, but I would say still more than 80, 85% of all drug testing in the workplace are still a urine test. It's still the, the main form of testing. Uh, or, uh, and then, the, you know, the, the newcomer, uh, that is a uh, growing ground is is the oral fluid based testing mm -hmm. and both of these tests have some pros and cons uh, maybe we can talk about that too uh, but uh, there is uh, you know for obvious reasons oral testing is more convenient and easier to uh, make sure that there is no uh, you know tampering with the with the sample uh, so it has been uh, preferred more and more but it also comes with some disadvantages because oral uh, fluid testing tends to be detecting shorter amounts of time. It has less of a um, acceptance in, in, you know, in, uh, in, in, you know, some industries. Um, it has lowered, you know, it, it has higher detection levels. So sometimes things that can be detected in urine cannot be detected in oral, and so forth. So. So, but those are the two two main forms of instant testing, is uh, are uh, urine and saliva. Interesting. Um, you mentioned. Um, a, I want to start kind of at the beginning and and talk about how a um, a person enrolls mm -hmm. in a test or participates in a test. What is the the, the process for uh, their consent being gathered, if any any, and um, typically how is the the uh, test uh, initiated is it requested by a workplace? Is it requested by the employee? Uh, what are the what are the typical flow of of starting uh, a test to be taken? Uh, it is oftentimes. I mean, that, uh, when we talk about workplace drug testing, it's important to separate pre-employment drug testing and then regular drug testing that might happen in the course of a. a in employment because of maybe a, a suspicion of use or some sort of accident that might happen at the workplace that might trigger a, a drug testing. So the first one I like to talk about is, is the pre-employment, which seems to be still, you know, 80% of the marketplace. Um, eh, oftentimes someone will apply for a job and it's a part of that uh, process, there is a point where, and it can ch change from company to company, but in most cases, once they are, you know, offered the position and accept the position, uh, they are uh, told that, you know, they have to go through a drug testing uh, as one of the check items. And uh, often the uh, in the employment, uh, pre-employment 
screening uh, scenario, drug testing and background screening happens almost concurrently. And there are a lot of users out there, a lot of, lot of service providers out there that actually combine those two and become uh, a service provider for both. It's not necessarily the case. I, I think uh, many of the background screening providers incorporate drug testing and use different contractors, uh, but some employers might treat them separately and might contract out to two separate uh, service providers to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. But once an employer requests an employee to a prospective employee to take a drug testing, uh, oftentimes they either send them a order form or something that will that will enable them to uh, to go to a laboratory uh, to to get the drug testing done. Um, some employers that are they often are more blue color type of workplaces, they might have a you know, high a number of um, uh, employees that they hire on a regular basis. Uh, some employers might have uh, resources or a clinic on site that could do the drug testing themselves right, right at the, you know, uh, right at the uh, workplace itself. But in most cases, uh, you as a prospective employee get it, you know, uh, get an order form uh, that instructs you to go and, you know, provide the sample at a, at a collection center. Uh, as well, part of that order, is the, the uh, determination upfront that the employer will receive or the prospective employer will receive the test results? Yes, the moment that uh, the person provides their sample. Again, it can happen in different ways. It, it can happen uh, where uh, the, the person is, is a part of the, the paperwork that they receive is being onboarded to the mm -hmm. workplace. Uh, they could sign a consent, which gives the employer the right to ask for the drug testing to be done and get the results of the drug testing. So that, that is, you know, you know, that can happen. Or if they are, uh, if, if this particular process of drug testing is not so um, incorporated into the onboarding process, uh, but could be a standalone order, then you might be sending as an employer to this person a, an order form to get their drug testing done, which is very much like an order form of a, of a lab test that you would get as, as, as a part of your, you know, your 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 health test to, to your uh, uh, you know your your doctor. It could be very well be a very similar process too. But the moment that if that's the case, I mean, you get an order to go and provide a sample at a laboratory collection center. Then it's a part of your signing process to give the sample at the clinic. You also give the consent uh, of your sample to be. Uh, analyze and, and you know, uh, the result to be sent to the employee. Is that an, do you understand that to be explicit consent where the employee is actually signing something? So either the employer is pre-collecting that if they have an established workflow and relationship with that lab organization would be my guess, or they're deferring that to the collection lab mm -hmm. to, for them to do it at the point of capture. So they're sort of either bringing it with them because they already signed one with their employer or the lab is going to collect it directly, but it's explicit. It is very explicit. Okay. Uh, you know, like, you know, uh, it is not uh, something that, uh, you have to look for. I mean, it, it, it is important that this this consent is explicit uh, because in most cases uh, the result will be delivered. In, I mean, in I would say pretty much all cases, I would say the result will not be delivered to the the, the donor uh, in this case, where mm -hmm. you will not get the result. It will be the employer that will get the result. So it's one of those very, I would say. Uh, unique cases as individuals, we will give a sample from our body where 
we will not, in most cases, have access to the result. Is that uh, the initial access or never access? In most cases, the never access. You, you will have to go through additional steps to request the results. You know, we have rights to get that result, but it is not a standard part of the process. Interesting. That that's uh, kind of a, a, a distinction between the if I go to my regular primary care physician and have a test result, uh, the lab almost always delivers the result to me as well as or can deliver the. <laughs> I guess I have to request that as well. You do uh, actually. There's a there are some lab laws that say that the lab actually needs to go to the provider and they give the provider a certain number a certain amount of time to be in touch with you as the patient you can imagine for example if you test positive for hiv you don't want to be getting that from the lab directly and not have a doctor call you to say you have hiv let's talk about it so there are some and i i would think these are probably there's some federal laws but there's probably also additional state law in the us that dictates that delay period where they give the provider like a jump start on contacting you before they they issue the labs to you directly. Mm -hmm. On the workplace testing, does any of the test result go to a medical provider as well, or is it strictly given to the employer for their review? In, in, the, context, in the context of workplace drug testing, there is another um, a, a medical provider called medical review officer, uh, MRO, which is uh, oftentimes these are you know medical doctors that uh, that gets these results. They look at the result before they you know endorse. I mean they you know finalize it and release it to the employer, uh, but they are in the middle as someone that acts to make sure the the lab result uh, could be determined to be a positive or a negative. Uh, and we're, and, and that's, that's mainly because of the cases where you could be, you know, prescribed a medicine and that medic medicine can make you positive uh, for, for, a, for a drug test, let's say opiates and so forth. Uh, so the medical review officer at this point, uh, once they get the positive result, would contact the donor and ask to see if they have any prescription or not. Because if you do have a prescription for opiates and you get a result that says opiates positive, it is the job of the medical review officer to, uh, uh, to, to qualify that and at the end give a negative result uh, because assuming that everything else is negative, but you are opiates positive, um, they, 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 you know, that way you would not necessarily fail the drug test result, you, even though you might be positive. So there is that medical review officer institution that makes sure, uh, you know, there is no, uh, there is no illicit drug abuse, but there is, if there is prescription, that drug use is within the framework of, uh, you know, uh, of that prescription. Is that medical review officer affiliated with the lab or affiliated with the the employer or independent? They are they they are often independent independent individuals uh, that gets the result from the lab, but they are also they can they can be contracted by the the lab provider. They can be contracted by the the third party administrator. You know, there's another you know institution called third party administrator. They could be just uh, 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 the partner for the employer to run their workplace drug testing. So if a third party administrator runs the drug testing program for a, for a corporation, they might contract out the lab portion to someone else. They might have an MRO inside, and they can just you know make sure that you know all pieces of this process is. Takes takes place it takes place in a seamless manner, and then they give the result to the employ you know employer, uh, and even third party administrators could be responsible for uh, uh, what will happen if there is a positive result uh, and how to deal with that positive result. Uh, and we're just you know we we started talking about pre-employment screening too. 
but then there are you know many different cases of uh, drug testing that will happen um, uh, uh, you know not just for pre-employment purposes but you know like managing your manager managing your employee uh, employee pool you know if you're a if you're an organization that is regulated by Department of Transportation like your know, trucking company or 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 a you know airline or you have a manufacturing facility and you have random testing that needs to be done in your you know in your organization and you randomly drug test your regular workforce uh, these third party administrators will be the people that will be managing that uh, that entire program and they can get very complicated so you know when we talk about just pre-employment screening it's a white collar in, in individual going and working for a bank you know you might have to be drug tested only once and that's it and you will never get drug tested again but if you're a drug driver then you have a, a lot of other uh, ways that you might encounter the workplace drug testing uh, in, as you mentioned uh, ongoing testing like for the, the trucking industry or airlines um is is there a consent process that's done once or does it have to be repeated with each test do you know uh, the differences there i i don't know you know the, the technicality of the differences but consent as far as i know you have to give you know explicit consent each time you provide you provide the sample okay um on the the ongoing um testing is are, are there scheduled intervals that were it can be known and scheduled in advance or is uh some of it random or a mixture of both uh i don't think there is any uh, pre-scheduled ongoing tests in the workplace that is a standard you know i'm sure you know like employment drug testing is a very i mean it's you know we're, you know employment at will you know uh, country here and you know you could customize a, a drug testing policy that can you know be you know very unique to your organization so there might be very well cases uh, uh, for some companies to have that but that is not very standard where you have a pre-scheduled uh, uh, timeline of when you will get drug tested it is either random uh, because it, and, and it's random in a sense that uh, everybody will get drug tested once a year at some point or it can be random in a sense that 10 percent of your workforce work workforce will be drug tested each year so there is a randomization that happens and it is the responsibility of the either the third party administrator or some randomization software to determine who is going to be get drug tested when and it does create complications because once you get a drug testing order uh, you have to do it in a certain amount of time uh, you have to show up and do the drug testing otherwise it, it will in, you know it will impact the uh, efficacy of the test because if you have two weeks to get drug tested and you know, in most cases, you, with saliva, the detection window is less than a week or maybe two weeks. Then you, you know you, you could just wait it out if you want to uh, avoid being you know uh, being getting a you know positive result. So so uh, so the uh, randomization and what happens after the selection done and the timeline has to be. A very strict policy and, and, and workflow. Are the the, the types of tests um, dictated by legislation, or are they at the discretion of the em employer? So you you might have a, 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 a test also for the same type of issue that could be a urine test or a saliva test. Are any of those things dictated by legislation, or are they at the discretion of the employer? Yes, there are uh, definitely regulated uh, uh, use cases and industries like Department of Transportation it has, is very strict. I mean, it, it is a very uh, defined process. It has its own laws and regulations. So if you are regulated by Department of Transportation, it, as an employer, uh, you have to fulfill those uh, requirements. You cannot make shortcuts. 
I'm sure you could add on additional restrictions. You can do additional testing, uh, but at minimum, you have to fulfill the Department of Transportation requirements. Then there are some federal, you know, employers uh, like you know, like the you know the military or some other federal agencies might have their own regulations for their employees, and similarly, states might very well do that with regards to their employees. And we, we might be talking about law enforcement, you know, prison, prison, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, prisons. That's not really an employee relationship, but. Uh, but the prison guards might be, you know, might be subject to different type of drug testing that comes from their, you know, you know, state regulations as well. So it's it is a very, you know, when you think about it, there is federal regulations involved, there are state regulations involved, there's employee employment law related regulations, there's privacy, there's healthcare, and that's really what makes uh, workplace drug testing a really complicated manner overall, because you have these so many different jurisdictions and so many different considerations, some of them federal, some of them industry, some of them state, they're all layered on top of each other. Uh, okay, uh, another question. Uh, how does the lab know that um, I'm the one showing up to get my test done and it's not my brother-in-law who's drug-free showing up to get a clear drug test for me on my behalf? They do, they do uh, ID checks, uh, you know, proper ID checks uh, uh, at the time of specimen uh, collection. Uh, but again, it is not a very robust system uh, because, you know, physical appearance might look similar to the ID. Um, even at the check-in process, you know, I've noticed that at some collection centers, you check in, they check an ID, but by the time you go and give the sample, uh, you know, there is not as strict of a flow that ensures that the donor is the, who, who the donor is supposed to be. And plus, in the cases of, you know, urine sample, now you have the issue of privacy uh, and how the, you know, collection is is done, and you might have to be, you know, in a in a, in a restroom stall, and you know they they might not even know the sample that comes uh, with you outside of that stall actually belongs to to you and just is freshly collected, so to speak. So there are a lot of um, uh, there are a lot of fail areas when it comes to the uh, you know uh, you know authenticity of the sample uh, that is being processed. I have a couple, I have a question and I hope that I'm gonna piggyback on Helen's question from the chat as well, which is, so, so what I, and this has been great, thank you very much. Um, when we talk about, so the lab is doing the, the lab test, they're obviously doing it in a more granular way, right? They're going to have the results. Those results are then being interpreted by the medical review officer, which is either at the lab or the employer, or more likely that third party administrator who's managing the employment testing program for, for people. Um, is that, are they then turning around and saying, yes, they can work or no, they can't work? Or are they then sharing the detailed lab result with the employer? It is, it, 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 yes, it, it becomes a checklist item in the onboarding process. So it yes, is, they can move ahead. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so it, it is the employer that will determine what is going to happen. And, uh, you know, again, going back to the employment screening, pre-employment screening, uh, or, or ongoing testing, uh, you could very well have, you know, employers that will maybe give another chance or have some sort of other program for the existing employee to, to, to come back and get tested again. Um, it is not up to the third party administrator or MRO to say, yes, this person can be hired or they can go to you to work. It is whatever that employer's internal workflow that determines the next action. Uh, 
the, the like the main role of a drug testing provider or an MRO is like providing a background screening test. I mean, background screening results. You know, you can have whatever you have on your background screening, uh, and you know, you could be, you know, you could have, you know, uh, not a clean sheet, or you can have issues, but that doesn't necessarily automatically uh, mean that you're not going to be working or you're not going to have to, you're going to have to stop working. Uh, it will all become a part, it, just a data point for the employer to determine what to do with that person. How are results transmitted to the, the medical review officer or the, uh, the company? Is that uh, through something like email or is it mailed to them in the U.S. <laughs> Postal Service? Do you know? You know, I'm old enough to remember that, the, yeah, that those things were happening, physical mail or faxes, uh, but luckily- They still do. They still do. <laughs> I, I, you know, yes, I'm sure that faxes <laughs> are still a thing. Uh, uh, but uh, in most cases, it, it is a part of the employee onboarding or employee management software system that incorporates those results. Uh, or if you are, if you do not have a software system that, uh, that uh, you know, that manages that process, it could be a, a digital result provided to you by a lab or by your third party administrator. And it can even be an email, which is not really supposed to be uh, because we are still operating with HIPAA and other other considerations, uh, but uh, but it, it can be just a digital you know digital form of result uh, in some shape or form. Encrypted or not uh, depends, I guess. They are are mostly you know like there there is a uh, if you're using a third party administrator solution or a lab, you have to have you know passwords, login. And, uh, uh, you know they, they are they are they are they're supposed to be they are supposed to be encrypted, um, but one thing that I I I I think I failed to clarify uh, uh, about the instant drug testing and lab like like lab processed uh, results is the fact that uh, instant tests when we talk about instant tests uh, oftentimes those are not really the, you know, confirmatory tests, they are screening tests. Uh, so it is possible to have, let's say, a urine test done instantly at a laboratory or at, at a clinic in, a, in an employer's, you know, factory. Uh, and then the result comes back negative, that everything will be just fine, and then you can continue it. But whenever there is a non-negative, it's not called positive, it is you know, intentionally called non-negative, that comes as a result of an instant test, then you have to go through a conformatory process uh, to a laboratory where the test result is, is, is provided to you by a formal uh, lab process. Uh, only then you could call it a confirmatory result where you can you know, make a decision. So non-negatives has to go through a laboratory process and an MRO before they can be a positive. I think we're all have learned the nuances of those, uh, you know, point in, instant tests right through our COVID experiences. We're all now well versed in their challenges and false positives, false negatives, et cetera, that would warrant the more comprehensive sensitive testing to follow up so that I think we've, we've all gotten our education on lab testing from that perspective. <laughs> yes, and, and, I, and I don't know the final the Department of Transportation, but for, you know, for good reasons, the Department of Transportation has very high standards where some of these screening tests might not be efficient, you know, efficient and they cannot be used. Uh, and you know, I, I you know, I, I like that fact. Whenever I'm on an airplane, and I know that the, the you know the pilots are well tested. <laughs> is this an area of growth, or is this something that's tapering off, uh, or is it flat over the last ten years and expected to be flat in the future? What what is the what's the trend line for this this whole area? 
Yeah. You mean like overall like workplace drug testing? Yes. You know, again, like you know, I, I, I might not be as 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 fresh uh, with my industry numbers, but it has been a constant uh, growth area. It's a growth industry, and it is going to continue to grow uh, as the drug abuse increases. Uh, this has to grow, unfortunately. Uh, the only uh, challenges uh, uh, that will come to uh, the growth. Uh, of drug abuse and growth of workplace drug testing correlation might come from the fact of um, unemployment rate and employment activity. Uh, what I mean by that is um, in, the, in the times where it is hard to find employees, uh, you, you know, like the unemployment rate, rates are very low and you are in, in the market uh, in a very competitive market, try to hire people. Uh, I see employers try to make shortcuts, make you know uh, decreases in their requests for drug testing because they they want to work with a you know a larger audience and they do not want to discourage people from applying to jobs. Um, uh, so in the in the times of uh, low unemployment, you see drug testing almost as a you know checklist item where employers will be very uh, you know will, will be hoping that the results will come back negative so that they can hire uh, and that thing completely switches when it's time for uh, recessions and uh, unemployment is 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 high then you not only use this as a way to really screen out and you are getting you get more serious about drug testing and you can not only increase the number of tests, but also the, the quality and, uh, and the efficacy of your tests because you want to make sure that the results are accurate. But then I have seen in the last couple of recession cycles where employers use this as a way of uh, attrition and decreasing their you know, workforce uh, because uh, it is way cheaper to, to do this uh, then you know, try to you know fire people. Um, yeah, mm. yeah. You drug I think, test them out. <laughs> <laughs> I I am also curious. You know, there's been a lot of change, at least in the U.S., around state regulation, um, both about around cannabis and some other. You know, we have I think on the West Coast, there's some some states that have. Uh, decriminalized, which I guess is the nuance there, but there, so there's some nuances around decriminalization, but also then legalization of some recreational drug use. And I'm sort of curious if you have thoughts on how that factors into it. Obviously there's some layers to this onion between state, federal, et cetera, in terms of regulations. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. Great question. I know I, um, you know, I was in the drug testing, you know, like our business, I mean, our company was in the drug testing business when this whole decriminalization uh, wave was coming uh, from Washington state and so forth. Uh, and honestly, we did not know what to expect uh, because Mariana, uh, Mariana test, THC, has always been the number one test uh, requested and conducted. Uh, but it was very quickly uh, clear to us that uh, decriminalization of certain drugs do not necessarily decrease the uh, uh, employers can deem, uh, you know, like uh, you know, it doesn't matter if it's uh, let's if if it is not. If it is legal to use uh, THC, uh, they can still use it as a way to, uh, you know, drug test their employees or prospective employees. Some states have specific laws that pre prevent that. Yes, so there is that level of complexity. But you know, keep in mind that you know alcohol and quite legal things to do. It's just that employers can choose to, you know. Uh, uh, test for uh, test their employees for you know for 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 
uh, you know, th those substances as well. Um, uh, but again, they have to have valid reason for uh, determining this abuse or use of these substances will have impact on the employment relationship and they cannot just use it for you know very discretionally so there are not only laws that prevent in some states to drug test and use the result you are you have some legal exposure about why you're doing it so even though uh, even though it may be legal, it might not be ad advised for a, a pilot or a truck driver to <laughs> to be consuming a particular substance because it might impair their ability to operate heavy equipment or um, other other safety concerns. Yeah, I mean, as far as I know, the Department of Transportation, you know, like the, it's it's like the screening, the cutoff levels are very specific. You know how the test is going to be conducted are very specific. I mean, Department of Transportation is very like like you know it, it is a very streamlined, it's very specific way of doing tests. And yes, of course, you know it doesn't mean that you know just because you're in particular state that you could you know you know use THC and operate a you know heavy machinery. Which segues me to a separate question related to to. Department of Transportation concepts. One of the scenarios that we've discussed in a without knowledge, so hopefully you can <laughs> help us think this through, is you know, we have most, and I, I don't know what statistics there are on this, but certainly every Uber I've been in, the driver almost always works for for Lyft also, right? And they end up being dual uh, contractors. Mm -hmm. And because those are transportation based roles, I believe they're also subject to a lot of drug testing. Um, and in that case, it seems like there could be some economies gained by the reuse of recent drug testing, so long as the results could be, you know, certified and, and vetted. Do you have any opinion about that? Or do you think everybody sort of wants their own and are willing to pay for it? Yeah, I, I do have some thoughts and I actually have some experience, you know, with uh, these type of use cases, even between the, these large providers and, you know, background screening companies providing services to these providers and how they could uh, want to use some economies of scale there. But before that, regarding Uber Lyft being Department of Transportation regulated, I, you know, I'm obviously, this is not, you know, I'm not an attorney, but I, you know, just because yeah. it is a transportation, you know, vehicle doesn't necessarily automatically make an Uber driver a DOT regulated, you know, a driver. Mm -hmm. uh, th that th There are different laws that would do that. I think they're not. Uh, and I would be surprised if they are because if they were Department of Transportation regulated, then the bar would be so high, I think a lot higher than what probably is right now for, you know, for, you know, for providers like Uber and Lyft or, 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 or others. Um, going back yeah. to, yeah, going back to, uh, going back to the economies of scale. I mean, I have seen, and I've talked to customers providers about that inefficiency uh, and not just from an economies of scale, scale purposes but even for uh, for uh, like you know higher like high, finding drivers you know onboarding the drivers and so forth um, you could have an, a person sign up for uber uh, get through the uber drug testing process and then next day go to lyft to do the same and has to go through the process again. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, this, as far as I remember, uh, and this is not for, for any specific service provider, but I think when we went, done some research in the past, we saw that people that are applying to Uber, Lyft type of, Grubhub type of places, uh, uh, almost up to 10% of the time, they never end up going through the, uh, the process of drug testing. Uh, they, they decide not to 
show up. It, not just because they might be using, but just because of its inconvenience and, and, and their, their scheduling issues and so forth. So the provider, the, the big companies like uh, these Uber and Lyft, they do have incentive to make the drug testing process as seamless and as efficient possible. And they would love to be able to use uh, piggyback on each other's re results as long as it is comparable because that will make their workflow easier. They will improve their you know, hiring rates as well. Uh, but because the results are, uh, the results for lack of a better term, belongs to the employers or prospective employers. And there is no way for those results to be uh, to shared uh, between potential employers. Uh, you have these very inefficient situation, you know, somebody getting a drop, drop hop, DoorDash, Uber, Lyft, drug testing that could be done, you know, four days in a row uh, uh, with, with increased uh, inefficiency and cost and inconvenience. The only difference might be, uh, again, I'm not talking about any specific companies here. If the background screening companies are incorporating drug testing under their workflow and their result management system, and they are doing service for multiple of these big companies, they do have the option to be able to share these. Uh, so I think the And not only the companies will benefit from it, work with, you know, <laughs> and now you have five different major clients, you would really be able to uh, uh, improve your bottom line and your profitability if you can figure out a way to, you know, uh, share results, still, you know, charge the clients the same, but decrease your cost uh, so that you only incur cost one time. Interesting. Um, I, I've kind of dominated this uh, set of questions. Uh, I wonder if there are any questions from our audience that uh, you could answer. Helen, did we get your question answered? Um, yeah, well, I was more interested to he hear if Sarah ha had any opinion about the crossover between, if he had any experience or um, thoughts on the crossover between what we're talking about in drug testing and living organ donation. Um, you know, in a lot of respects, it's very similar in that you go and provide, you know, blood or whatever, provide the sample and it goes off and it, for, for kind of privacy concerns so that the donor, the, the person providing the sample doesn't see the health information of say the recipient, the person who's looking for the, you know, the donation, um, you don't see those results. So it's something where you, 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 you provide the, the donation or, you know, you provide the sample, it goes off and it's shared between numerous parties, healthcare providers, the usually a donation center, and then doctors, uh, several doctors who do the testing and review panels and boards and whatnot. Anyways, it just sounds like there's a lot of overlap. And I was curious if Sarah had had any experience with, with <clears throat> that aspect of donation, um, medical, um, you know, medical sample donation, or if they're sort of apples and oranges a little bit. <clears throat> I mean, uh, Helen, uh, it, 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 you know what? I don't actually like, like it's the many of the same things uh, sound familiar, you know, similar in, in the way uh, you're describing, but I don't know anything about the living donor donation use cases and the flows to be able to make any, you know, any connection or even comment on it. Oh, sure. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, I think, you know, when we were talking last year about <clears throat> these sort of expansion use cases for Cardia beyond, you know, COVID and travel and, and whatnot, I think we were looking at how can we provide and, and work as a community to build, um, you know, a, a code base or a... <clears throat> pardon me, the technologies that could be used by the most amount of people for the most amount of use cases. And I, I think that that it just sounds to me that like if we were to focus on um, putting together a sort of um, implementation of Cardia specific to drug testing, that it could be used in other types of medical testing environments as well, besides drug testing. Um, 
and so anyway, so in, in terms of expansion use cases for Cardia, it might be um, this, this is again, I think another opportunity to uh, bring more um, kind of use cases into the fold. That's all. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I, you know, I, I guess the good and the bad thing about workplace drug testing is, is it because it's so complicated? There are so many, you know, uh, uh, different layers of, you know, regulation, law, use cases. There are a bunch of different substances we're talking about, some of them being illicit, some of them being illicit, but, you know, uh, might have uh, impact on the way someone can perform on a job site. Uh, once you are able to build a robust workplace drug testing uh, uh, use case, I mean, platform and flow, I can definitely see potential of taking pieces out of there and using it more simpler, straightforward, uh, uh, more flat-like uh, workflow. So, so, uh, so I, I, I think there is definitely a, a chance of um, economies of scale there too. Absolutely, thank you. Anybody else have questions they wanna either type in the chat box or just come off mute and speak? Yes, I'd like to know if there's a possibility, if you think that there's a need for, say in this use case, the employer to allow an option for the employee candidate, employment candidate to, when they click on the consent form on the iPad or whatever is presented to them, that they could also just enter their um, wallet ID so that the test could be uh, electronically sent and placed into their wallet because some employees might have the concern that the uh, employee, that they want to make sure that they are trusted by the um, potential or candidate employee mm -hmm. as a user interface. I, I, I think that's a rather um, more of a philosophical question um, because yes, I, I, I think it, it, I believe as you know, individuals, we should have access. The results should belong to us and then we should share with those results with whoever we, whoever we want. And, we are, and we're just talking about workplace drug testing, but you know, keep in mind, there's, there's all kinds of parole testing. There is you know, uh, cases where you know, trusts require their, you know, the, you know, like some get drug tested on a regular basis to get you know, funding from, uh, trusts or or you know divorce cases. So the, the use cases of drug testing is is way beyond just workplace drug testing. Uh, uh, but you know employers for for practical purposes, I don't think unless they have to would want to allow that because it just opens up a whole quite you know uh, uh, set of questions. Uh, you know, you get a result, you know, and he says, you know, there are different cutoff levels, there's screening levels, there are, you know, like, there's a bunch of different drugs. I mean, if you look at a drug testing result, it is a complicated, you know, it's a complicated result. Uh, and, and it's often not the result that the employer even might get. Employer might get a result that is filtered through and made it more simplified after an MRO decision. Um, uh, but I would think that the employers would rather not have the prospective employees get their drug result uh, because if they are, let's say you're, you get the job, you assume that the result was negative. But if you don't get the job, then you know what, what did the what 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 did the results say? And you can still request the results, but then you know that that can all become a whole new legal issue and, and, and a whole other set of, um, uh, you know, set of, uh, you know, state laws or employment laws can come into play. So this, you know, I, I, I think it, it is way more than just an employee or prospective employee having access to the result uh, because uh, things will probably become a problem when that person in some shape or form fails the test. My question was basically, 
as a user interface designer. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know if Hyperledger should offer the option of some employer or probation officer, whoever it is, allowing the employee to own their own data, to say when they, when they walk in there, when they sign that consent form, there will be lines, fields that the uh, potential employee or whatever could fill in. And those fields could be, say, A, send it to my wallet, here's my wallet address. B, send it to Uber, here's their wallet address. C, send it to, you know, Grub, whatever they're called, that's, here's their address. D, send it to Lyft, here's their wallet address. So that gi giving them the option to make their drug test available to others, would that, would that be, or do you want to restrict Hyperledger's and user interface? Thank you, over. I mean, I can't say anything about obviously the hyperledger and how they, you know, how you know that might be, you know, that might be done. But uh, it it is definitely, I think, a, a good use case for people to be able to do it. And plus, a, we could very well be in a situation in, in the future where, you know, as potential employees, we could drug test ourselves if there was an option. To be able to share the result, um, uh, because it, I mean, the employers request the drug test results, the drug testing, because that's a part of their process. But if there was a, a trust in the system, uh, and there was a way to share between wallets uh, an authentic result, uh, employers would love not to pay for a drug test and would do it much easier. So it couldn't even be a, a it, you know, it, it can even be an incentive for an employer to hire an employee uh, that might already have a drug test result that they can share and they might even have paid for. It. Mm -hmm. Just to do a quick time check, we're a couple of minutes over, so I want to make sure we're not messing up everybody's day. Um, hopefully that answers the question. I've taken some notes here. Feel free to review and adjust if, if you think I misinterpreted that. Uh, I just want to take a minute and say thank you very much for this conversation. It was enlightening. We're very happy to have met you and heard your input. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. At our next meeting, which is on June 8th, we're going to have Sarah, I think it's Samus, uh, from GCOM come and talk to us um, a lot about sort of the vaccination space, but potentially some other topics as well. And so I would encourage those of you who are here today to give us a listen at our next meeting on the 8th with a z different Zoom link. So make sure you've got the calendar correct from Hyperledger. Thank you again, Sir Hot. We are very grateful for your time and, and expertise that you're willing to share with us. Oh, well, thank you. I'm glad it was uh, somewhat useful. Have it was. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks, very much. everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.